Good afternoon and welcome to this month's Midric Seminar Series Lecture. Before we get started, I would like to announce to folks that Midric will have a town hall on May 6th, starting at noon central time. And the topic here will be the Midric user portal. Okay, back to the Midric seminar. Today, we are happy to have Natalie Bonk, who is a third year senior graduate student in medical physics at the University of Chicago. She did her undergrad at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She is part of TDP 3D within Midric. Her topic for today is the role of Midric sequestration and task-based sampling in the independent evaluation of artificial intelligence in medical imaging. Please welcome our speaker. Natalie, you can begin. All right, thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen. All right. Welcome. As Dr. Geiger mentioned, my name is Natalie Bond, and today I will be discussing the role of metric sequestration and task-based distribution sampling in the independent evaluation of AI and medical imaging. This work was done along my, alongside my collaborators and mentors in the Midric Technology Development Project 3D, Dr. Heather Whitney, Dr. Kyle Myers, and Dr. Mary Lynn Geiger. This slide lists our funding sources. It's also important to note that Midric is an NIH funded research collaboration between the AAPM, ACR, and RSNA, and is hosted at the University of Chicago. In this talk, I will first give a brief overview of the motivation and goals of the Midric Technology Development Project I'm a member of, and then I will walk through our two major projects, sequestration and task-based distribution sampling. For both of these projects, I will discuss major aims, describe the processes developed, and give an example of implementing these processes. I'll end by discussing a few limitations and overall conclusions for this work. First, a brief introduction. Despite recent interest and excitement about AI and medical imaging, lack of diverse data sets remains to be a critical issue. From this example published in the MIT Technology Review, at its time of publication, hundreds of algorithms had been developed for COVID diagnosis and seemingly none of them were deemed to have any clinical utility. In a quote from the publication this review article cited, there were multiple key reasons for this shortcoming, including lack of representative patients in control groups, non-standard exclusion of patients, and overfitting of AI models as a result of the limited data used. As you can see, most of these issues stem from the data itself used. To further show this importance of the data used in AI training, this preprint paper provides a rather shocking example of AI being able to trivially predict self-reported race from medical images alone, a task which radiologists themselves cannot do. The risk of this work in, in a clinical setting comes as a result of the potential bias that could then be introduced when an algorithm unknowingly uses self-reported race to bias decision-making resulting in misclassification or misdiagnoses. From these examples, we can see that collection and curation of high quality and population representative data is critically important to the clinical utility of AI. Testing these algorithms on independent data is key to estimating future generalizability. However, collecting this data is particularly difficult in medical imaging. To help address these issues, the Midric Technology Development Project 3D contains two key projects. The first is creation of a sequestered data commons for independent testing of algorithms. The sequestered data commons exists as a subset of about 20% of all the data that is submitted to Midric. It is restricted from public access and not posted on data.midric.org as shown here. The sequestered commons itself will act as a large pool from which representative samples can be drawn to act as test sets to estimate nearly real world performance of AI algorithms. To, to create a sequestered common that is representative of all the data available, population demographic characteristics are balanced between the public and sequestered data commons using our developed algorithm. The second key project of our team is the task-based distribution sampling of the sequestered commons, so how we actually use that sequestered data. That is, for a specific clinical task, Drawing a distribution of cases from the sequestered commons matched the clinical claim or intended patient population. 
and then sampling from that distribution of cases, a representative subset, which can, can be used as a test set in algorithm performance evaluation. The first of these projects I will discuss is the sequestration of data, including the processes used to create the sequestered commons for Midric. As I mentioned previously, approximately 20% of the data submitted to Midric will be placed in sequestered commons that will be used for algorithm performance assessment. As of this month, over 2,000 imaging studies have been placed in the sequestered commons, while almost 30,000 imaging studies have been released on data.midric.org. The number of imaging studies in the public commons is much larger because the public commons includes cases from special data sets that are not yet processed through, through the sequestration pipeline. To utilize the sequestered data, users will submit their finalized algorithms to Midric, and a sample of the data will be selected for testing based upon the user's task. Midric will then provide the results of the algorithm test back to the user without letting the user know which cases were used for testing or giving any access to case-based performance results. If the user were to submit an algorithm to Midric for sampling again, a new sample will be drawn from the sequester data to assure the generalizability and again, maintain the integrity of the test set. As I mentioned previously, bias and lack of generalizability has been a key shortcoming of AI systems. To assure both data sets are representative of the population available, demographic characteristics were balanced across the sequestered and public data. This will help to address gaps and biases in data from particular sites, bias of the database itself, and bias in algorithms developed using the database. This slide provides an example of the goals of sequestration. Here we can see that incoming cases are placed into the respective buckets of the public commons or the sequestered commons in batches, where each batch is proportionally split between the two subsets. To enable a fair comparison between the publicly available data and the testing data, the proportions of all types of both the common cases and the rare cases should be balanced between the two data sets. Balancing a large number of variables between subgroups is a topic widely studied in the field of clinical trial development. However, similar logic has rarely been applied to the field of machine intelligence due to the nature of relatively simple trained test splitting in small independent data sets. First, I'll give an overview of our current processes for sequestering data. Prior to sequestration, de-identified clinical data of COVID-19 patients are submitted to Midric through data input portals hosted by ACR and RSNA. Quality of submitted medical imaging studies is assessed and the associated metadata are harmonized for representation within the data model at data.midric.org. Subsets of the incoming data are then designated as open or sequestered on an ongoing basis in batches created at a regular interval. To actually do the sequestering, first, the identified patient IDs are compared across all previously processed batches and any data of patients for whom there's already data available in either the public or sequestered commons are placed in the applicable commons. This process assures that all images from longitudinal studies of a given patient are contained in only one of the commons. Data of remaining patients in an intake batch are then sequentially separated into multiple strata based upon the anonymized clinical site ID, modality, COVID status, age group, race, sex at birth, and ethnicity. Within each resulting bin, the patients are then randomly assigned to the open data set or the sequestered data set with proportions of approximately 80 and 20% respectively, aiming to balance the joint distribution of all stratified variables. Since for many patients, imaging exams from multiple modalities were available, such as chest CT and chest radiographs, the separation of patient data by modality was accomplished by first sorting all modalities present in the data set for most least prevalent. Patient data were then sorted by the most prevalent image modality for each patient, and patient images from any other less prevalent modality are simply sorted with that data. Patient age data were grouped into categories matching the age group categories defined by the Center for Disease Control COVID-19 database and self-reported sex at birth, race, and ethnicity were grouped in agreement with the categories defined by the NIH. An example data set containing de-identified demographic information from 4,662 patients was used to test the sequestration process. All patient data in, in the example data set originated from the same clinical site ID, and for this example, we assumed them to be from the same image modality and COVID status. The developed sequestration algorithm was then run on the remaining demographic variables 
of race, age, sex at birth, and ethnicity, each containing eight, eight, two, and four categories, resulting in a total of 512 strata to achieve a similar distribution of variables between the original data and the two subsets. Results obtained from splitting the example data set using our stratified sampling method are shown here for the category of age. As can be seen from the table and the pie charts, both subsets very closely match the distribution from the input data set. Similarly, results from splitting the example data set are shown here for the category of race. While the population of each subcategory here is not as evenly distributed as the subcategories of age, the balance of the distributions remain quite even for both large and small subcategories. Lastly, for the categories of sex at birth and ethnicity, we again see a similar even distribution of each subcategory. For all demographic variables balanced, both subsets match the distribution of variables from the input data set with a maximum percent in a variable from its original fraction of 0.4%. To compare the performance of, sequest of the sequestration algorithm to naive separation of the dataset by an overall 80-20 random drawing, ignoring demographic variables, we applied the algorithm to the example data for 2,000 iterations and then compared the resulting distributions to those obtained with randomly splitting the data for 2,000 iterations. In each iteration, a different random seed was used to initiate the splitting. The resulting distributions were compared by creating histograms of the percent difference from expectation as outlined here, where N of T is the number of patients in a given category in total from the intake data set, and N open is the number of patients in a given category generated in the open data set, which would be expected to be equal to 80% of N of T if the data set split was exact for that iteration. This metric was then calculated for each different iteration and plotted in histograms for a given bin within a category. For example, in the race category, all Asian patients. The histogram of the percent difference from expectation over 2,000 iterations for just the subcategory of Asian patients in the 80% 80 80 subset are shown here, where the blue bars indicate values from random sampling and the orange bars indicate values from stratified sampling. The x-axis of this plot gives the range of the percent difference from expectation values calculated where smaller values indicate a better balance between the subset and the original data set and larger values indicate worse balance. From this plot, we can see that stratified sampling is notably narrower, indicating that the balance for stratified sampling was notably better than for random sampling. Here we can see the histograms of the percent difference from expectation for all categories of race. For, for most categories analyzed, sequestration by stratified sampling provided lower percentage differences from expectation in general than naive random, randomization as indicated by the narrower distributions of the orange histograms here. However, for some categories with low prevalence, such as having a race of American Indian or Alaska Native, the algorithm of stratified sampling did about as well as random sampling. Histograms of other demographic variables showed similar trends as shown here, with the impact of stratified sampling over simple randomization varying with the prevalence of each subcategory. While the high degree of similarity in distributions across both subsets is promising, it's extremely important to note that the ultimate goal in constructing a sequestered data set for algorithm evaluation does not aim for perfect symmetry. This is to avoid matching the test set to the training set since that could allow one to approximately train to the test. Sequestration will provide a method to monitor and maintain a high level of similarity in the variable distributions, but perturbations in these demographics will also be purposely implemented to assure algorithm generalizability. It's also important to note some key limitations of this work. In particular, the example database used did not include the variables of COVID status, image modality, or site ID, but these variables have been added for future use with data for data.midric.org. Further, as noted previously, the ability of stratified sampling to, to achieve a higher degree of balance than simple randomization is highly dependent on the incoming data set size. This is also noted as a limitation for clinical trials that use similar methods. To overcome this, the authors plan to implement a method such as minimization or propensity score matching to perform sequestration in the future. Also, future data may be sequestered to optimize overall balance of the data common rather than just by the individual batch. 
Lastly, while ensuring similar distributions of demographic variables may help to reduce potential algorithm bias, certain biases will still persist and must be acknowledged. The authors also acknowledge that certain labels of race, ethnicity, or sex at birth may not adequately describe all populations or provide a clear correlate to genetic ancestry, which emphasizes the importance and of oversight and monitoring of AI algorithms for equity in their applications to healthcare. As additional information and understanding of case descriptors is acquired, the sequestration algorithm will be modified to accommodate. Now we'll talk about our second project, task-based distribution sampling. As a quick recap, when a user submits their developed algorithms to Madrig, a sample of the data will be selected for testing that is matched to the user's task. Madrig will then provide the overall performance assessment results back to the user without letting the user know which cases were used or give any, giving any access to the, to the user for the cases used for testing. To reiterate, the sequestered set in its entirety will not be used as a test. Only independent task-based samples will be used as test sets. To allow for truly independent testing of many users' algorithms, the integrity of this, the sequestered commons must be maintained meaning that users will not be able to know what subset of cases was used in testing or what cases are available for testing to avoid training to the test. Continuous growth of the sequestered commons will aid in this effort of maintaining the anonymity of the sequestered cases. To outline this process of drawing a test set from the sequestered commons, we can define two examples. Task A, you could say diagnosis of COVID positive versus COVID negative in chest radiographs in some specified population, and task B, estimation of COVID severity from CT images in another specified populations. All the data that is available to the public commons can be used for algorithm development and training at the, at the discretion of the user. Once the algorithm is finalized and they are ready to submit it for regulatory clearance or publication, sequestered data can be used for testing. To sample the sequestered commons and create a test set, First, distributions match to the task and specified population are drawn. Then, random samples can be selected from the distribution to create possible test sets. In this scenario, in which a particular algorithm uses sequestered data more than once, a new random sample will be drawn to assure that we are using independent testing to preserve the integrity of the sequestered commons, preventing a user from training to the test. A similar sampling of the drawn populations could also be accomplished for task B, but the underlying distributions would include a different subset of patients matched to the specified population. Conversely, for the case of a grand challenge where a number of algorithms are compared, a single sample of cases will be drawn to allow for algorithm performance comparison. The data sets used for grand challenges will also be made publicly available after use unlike samples used for individual algorithm testing. To draw these distributions and samples, a two-step method was developed. First was to use optimized quota sampling to draw from the sequestered commons of sampling frame. We can think of this as the continuous distributions as shown in the figure that are matched to the specified target population distributions. The second was then to select a simple random sample from that sampling frame to create approximately independent test sets matched to the target demographic. The first step of this process is to compare the overall population of the data available, here the entire sequestered commons, to the specified target population distribution. Differences in each category of interest will define the margin by which the drawn distribution will have to be modified to reach the target. So here we would calculate the differences in, say, the race category between the available proportion of each subcategory and what we are aiming to get in our target population. To explain this process in more detail, we can walk through a simplified two-category example. Here, our chosen categories are sex at birth and COVID status. So say we have a desired target population of 50-50 male-female and maybe 75-25 COVID negative, COVID positive. If our evolving task-based sample here, initially the entire sequestered commons was 60-40 and 80-20, we could then calculate, a, calculate a, a category deviance for each different subcategory we're analyzing. We can then define a metric to quantify the overall match of the evolving database to the target population, here called the maximum margin. 
equal to the maximum difference in any demographic category between the target population percentage and the current evolving task-based sample percentage. We can also quantify the fit of any patient to the target population, here called the patient demographic fit score, equal to the sum of the deviance from each demographic category. As an example, for a female COVID negative patient, we can calculate the score as the sum of negative 10 from having a sex at birth as female, plus 5% from having a negative COVID status, equating to a total score of negative 5%. For each category, a negative value would indicate more of that given category is needed to reach the target demographic, while positive values indicate less of that given category is needed to reach the target demographic to jointly balance the demographic profile of each patient. To walk through this example, in each iteration, patients with the highest demographic fit scores are removed from the evolving task-based sample at a fixed rate. Then the patient-based scores and the overall data set category maximum margin are recalculated. And this process continues until that category maximum margin reaches some pre-specified value. So this is where we started with our evolving task-based sample. We can see that our maximum margin starts at 10%. If we then removed some subset of patients, this margin would drop as we can see our task-based sample becomes slightly closer to our target population. We would then continue this through iterations until that maximum margin reaches a satisfactory threshold and we select our sample as the evolving, um, as the resulting um, sampling frame. To illustrate this further, in, we used an example database of about 9,500 subjects, and we chose to draw a population that was matched to the US Census with a maximum category margin of 1% for two different tasks. The first was binary classification of COVID positive or COVID negative, and the second was ranking of COVID severity. Here I'll walk through the details of implement, imp, implementing this for the first task in our example database, where the initial demographic characteristics of this database are shown here on the left, and the target population was defined mostly based upon the US Census data, but also we modified it to just have an age of 18 plus and to have a target COVID status prevalence of 50-50. We also wanted only chest radiograph exams for this task. We then used our created optimization function to draw patients that were matched this specified population to create a sampling frame that matched this target population demographic within 1%. If we were to plot the patient demographic fit deviance metric for all patients in the example database at three points throughout this optimization, we see the pattern shown here, where the initial iterations of histogram scores is quite wide, showing a broad range of patient demographic fit metrics. And as we continue along, the histogram becomes much narrower, indicating that patients in the drawn sample very closely match the target population. We can also look at the database maximum margin in any category. As we can see, the metric value decreases as we continue through the iterations, similar to an optimization loss function. This metric also defines when we stop the optimization, here selected to be when it reaches 1%. Discontinuities in the slope indicate a shift from one category dominating the max percent deviation to another category as subjects are removed from the sample and the overall demographic distribution shift. To discuss the results of these example tasks, here I'll first highlight the differences between the tasks. So the first task was looking for COVID diagnosis and just chest radiographs. So we wanted a COVID status of 50-50 and again, just chest radiograph exams. For task two, it was slightly different. We we're just looking for COVID severity. So we only wanted a COVID status of positive and we we're just looking at CT images. Again, we were matching both of these tasks to the distribution of demographic categories in the US Census. Using our 1% maximum category margin, we were able to draw 971 patients for the first task and 593 patients for the second task. If we were to collect possible test sets with approximately 10% overlap for each task, we'd be able to draw possible test sets of about 100 patients for the first task and about 60 patients for the second task. Then now I'll walk through a few sampling limitations and future work for this project. As I kind of alluded to on the last slide, the size of the selected test set at the very end is limited by the availability of the data in the commons and the similarity of that specified population to the available data. So if we had a very different specified population than what was available, the size of that available test set may be very small. In addition, test sets cannot be infinitely sampled for, for performance assessment without compromising the integrity of the data commons. So the size of the available test set will help us to define the potential repeatability 
because it will depend on the overlap between available test sets. Now I'll walk through a few conclusions. In review, we have discussed a few key achievements. The first is the establishment of a sequestered data commons through multi-step stratified sampling algorithm. This is currently in use for data process for metric, both for data at data.metric.org and for sequestered data. And we have sequestered over 2000 imaging studies. The second is the development of a task-based distribution sampling algorithm using optimized quota sampling. And this is preparing for implementation, both for drawing from the sequester database for algorithm testing and for using grand challenges. As a final reminder, the sequester data is for testing algorithms that are already trained and ready for the next step, whether that be publication or regulatory clearance. It is not intended to be part of the training process as no case specific feedback or anything other than an overall score is given. Additionally, if an algorithm is submitted for evaluation again, a new random sample of data will be drawn to test the algorithm to maintain the integrity of sequestered commons. In conclusion, creation of a large common sequestered data set, which can be sampled for specific task-based algorithm performance evaluations could provide increased evaluator confidence and potentially a new gold standard in the field of machine intelligence. Further, a sequestered database for algorithm testing could allow for expedited clinical implementation if algorithms developed for medical decision making if accepted by regulating bodies. I would again like to thank my funding sources, all the members of the Midric Technology Development Project 3D and our close collaborators, the Midric Technology Development Project 3C, as you see in this nice Zoom picture here. All the members of the Geiger Lab, the members and the members of the Chicago Graduate Program in Medical Physics. Particular thanks to Dr. Jean Pinello and the team at Gen3 Data Commons for their assistance. Thank you for listening to my talk. And you can learn more about Midric at our website at midric.org and at our media accounts at Twitter and YouTube. Thank you very much, Natalie, very informative. And we are open for questions either in the chat or through the Q&A button. Um, if not, I'm always happy to start off. So given the importance of um, independent testing, especially if one is going to go through regulatory and ultimately you'd be used in a, in a, in a clinical arena, um, sequestering is extremely important and say there's an investigator and I know I, I know you talked about this but I think it's so important um, it would be good to just clarify it um, uh, given an investigator or even a company in the future that wants to have their algorithm tested and this independent test set how many what happens if they come back one two three times and how many times could they come back yeah, so at this point, we don't have a clear definition of what that number is on repeatability of testing with data from the sequestered commons. But as I mentioned there at the end, that repeatability will depend on the availability of data in a sequestered commons, which is why the continuous growth of the sequestered commons will be so important. And also what cases are available. So we'll, we will define as a team some sort of uh, metric on what cases could be overlapped or not, um, and then be able to provide that user with a, a number of this this algorithm could be tested again or it could not be. Thank you. And we do have a question in the chat. I will read it. Okay. Can you comment on how to extend the approach to cover time as an added factor with the goal to quantify performance drift over time post deployment? So um, whether um, the algorithm is drifting given that um, uh, the data that we have is is different based on either the population or acquisition system, as well as once a post deployment, uh, let's say if a system has already gone through regulatory and is out there, um, how how could they be tested? Because um, as as uh, populations change, data changes based on acquisition. So. Yeah, that's a really important question, particularly as we start to think about long COVID and having more longitudinal studies, so looking at patients over time. Um, so one aspect that we're looking at for this is monitoring the bias and diversity in the sequestered commons and the open commons over time. So this is a project that our technology development project also works on, and there will be a, present a presentation on this at the um, AAPM meeting this summer. 
Um, and then we're also talking about, okay, what happens after, after some time and this algorithm has already gone through regulatory. So at that time, our, hopefully our sequestered comments has grown and they could come back and test again to, to assure that their performance is not drastically changing with the new available data. Okay, thank you. Um, questions are popping up. Um, another one in the chat and then I'll go to a Q&A one. How do you decide on the required testing sample size from a sequester cohort for each application? Um, some of that might be by prescribed by the uh, investigator asking to be tested and, and the needs. But Yeah, so, so there's a few different ways we can look at it. If we're just looking for um, independent algorithm evaluation, so for a given user, that will depend on the specified population that they will be looking for. So the size of the sample that we can draw will, will depend on that specified population. And then if they wanted it to reach a given number of patients, we might say we, we cannot reach that at this point, or here's the number that we can give at this time. Alternatively, for an example such as grand challenges, we could say, okay, we have a given number that we are trying to reach, and then we could create this sequestered data set, this test set, excuse me, over time to reach that number to be used in grand challenges since that data is very important and will eventually be released to the public. Thank you, uh, a lot of interest. Two more questions. Have you considered giving confidence intervals on the AUC that is measured through the sequester data since the exact AUC will be dependent on the actual cases selected? Yeah, so this is something we've definitely considered and discussed in our technology development project meetings. Um, because there have been a few publications that have cited um, that giving that exact number could provide users um, too much information that could allow them to eventually train to the test. Um, so we will consider doing this um, once we actually implement this for individual users um, to help maintain the integrity of that sequestered commons. Yes, and just as we look at how um, the effect of the training data set, it's very important to look at the effect of the test set. So. Um, while the sequestering um, data, the sequester data commons is very useful for a practical reason of testing algorithms before they get to the public in an in a, in independent way, it also lends itself to much research questions such as the effect of the training set, the effect of the test set, and the repeatability um, and reproducibility of the output. Great, and another question. The demographic information looks great and is needed for comparing contrasting the study population with the clinical population. Does your database include information like site and imaging system model and protocol like reconstruction algorithm? We wish, and eventually. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So at this time, we do in include an anonymized site ID, and that and that's our, our first demographic variable that we look at. We know it's very important, as it can also be a correlate for many other demographic variables, as different data from different sites will have different characteristics. Um, however, at this time, I don't think that we have um, the actual imaging machine, but I think that data is available. We just are not sequestering based upon it. Yes. But we're... It would be great just as one builds a cohort to have multiple data elements and using those also to do your sequestering. Um, uh, but as MIDRIC grows and the data set size grows, one will be able to do more and, and uh, more of that. Also, um, uh, currently, um, you know, as long as the Data elements are within what is being asked by the investigator. You know, what is their claim? What is their clinical question? What is their population of targeting for their algorithm? As long as those elements are available, um, we'll be able to sequester that. Um, this has been a great discussion. I don't know if there's any other uh, questions out there. Um, thank you all. I, those were very good questions. Um, I, I think we, we're good. Great. Um, thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you all for uh, coming here to listen. 
Yes, and, and please tell your friends who might have missed it that this will be posted on the YouTube, the Midrick YouTube channel. So sign up for that and uh, get that. And also um, a reminder again, if you're interested in the user portal, come to the Midrick Town Hall on May 6th at noon central.